Popovich. He's going to be talking about how to find and use interesting unauthenticated soap services. Take it away, Nick. <laughs> What's up, crew? Uh, like you said, my name is Nick Popovich. My handle's Pipefish. Uh, first time at ShmooCon and first time speaking at a con. So pretty excited. Uh, thanks for coming out. Drink. <laughs> Drink. So uh, I figured the best thing to do before I get any background or about me, stuff that is really only interesting to me and my mom, is uh, give you a summary of the presentation. Because a lot of folks, when they heard this, they were like, do what now? So um, an ISP provided an application, and uh, through this talk, I'm going to explain how using the application that connected to a SOAP service on the internet, I was able to uh, gather a lot of information that I really shouldn't have been able to have access to. And it's really cool. The talk before really marries well with this, because the talk before was really informative and gave you a lot of good information about laws and whatnot, and how the disclosure process may be daunting to individuals. And this is kind of a success story. Um, so, the next slide's a little about me. <laughs> you can't see my slides because you're in the front row. Uh, just some background real quick. I am a pen tester at the moment. I have some experience in the military, uh, mainly um, military DOD, then I've worked in the private sector as well. I've worked admin and, and the defensive side of security as well as the offensive side of security. Um, worn a lot of hats, contractor civil servant, soldier, consultant, and all that jazz. So uh, I am a father, husband, and I suffer from a curious hermit syndrome. I, uh, I don't do anything. Like, you guys do the things. I don't do the things. I just sit at my computer, and I get paid for it. And then when I'm off the clock, I sit at my computer and tinker. So if you have any ideas for a good unplugged hobby, I'm all ears later. And I'm also uh, a veterinarian, or a veteran. <laughs> Again, I just wanted to wrap it up, another kind of to the point. Um, it is in the news a lot lately, you know, folks finding hard-coded backdoors into um, consumer-grade gear. Uh, so it's not like it's a topic that's not covered, but this is just another instance of how the gear and application that are on small business, medium-sized business, or even home office uh, environments don't get the kind of scrutiny and are put under the research microsc microscope uh, as much as, say, enterprise-class software or applications and whatnot. Uh, and this is also uh, hopefully going to encourage folks. Everybody in this room is sharp in their own right, and I am no genius. And so after we go over the kind of cool things that I think uh, are cool that I found, hopefully it'll show you that everybody in here should just go home and, and take a look at their own environments or uh, articulate to their friends, family, uh, and small businesses to look into their own environments and put things under the research microscope because they may be surprised at what they found. Um, I, I just really also want a, an opportunity to talk about some cool stuff I did. <laughs> and then finally, I'm not a lawyer. The dude before me was definitely a lawyer, and I'm not. Um, I'm going to go over my, in a vacuum, my disclosure experience, kind of in an encouraging light, because this is one of those situations where um, the messenger was not shot, because I'm here and I'm not in prison, and uh, go over some best practice, not, not even best practices, go over my opinion on how if you do choose to disclose, the way that I went about it and the outcome and just some caveats to that. But I'm not giving law advice and the, the, if you didn't catch the talk before me, go online and, and check that out because that was pretty cool and informative as well. So brief story kind of set you up with what got me started with this. I moved and I needed to move my ISP service from my old house to my new house. So I called them up and I didn't do the, the your own bundle where you set it up yourself. I was in the middle of moving. Didn't feel like dealing with it, so I just said, you know, come out and do the things. Excuse me. So they did. They sent a technician out, and he did what technicians do, and it was fine. And he goes, all right, I'm done. And I took my, and he said, let's test it out. So I took my laptop and plugged it into the router, which was in the kitchen at the time, and, and I connected to the internet. I was like, great, thank you. And he said, no, no, I need to run a tool to get credit for the install, and also it runs some diagnostics and checks some things. I was like, uh, okay. I didn't understand, but... He pulled out a thumb drive. He's like, put this in your slot. <laughs> and I, was, I said, well, random guy I don't know handing me a thumb drive, of course I would be more than willing to take your sketchy thumb drive and get enrolled in a botnet. But uh, he was pretty adamant. He's like, I don't get credit for this, man. You're just harshing me. And I was like, all right, marinate, chill out. Um, and I knew the next thing he was going to say is, he looked down and goes, oh, we don't support Macs. 
and I was running uh, Ubuntu, and I was like, all right, it's fine, we'll uh, hold on. So I, I spun up a quick, one of my throwaway VMs that's isolated, and I did the USB paths through, and I plugged his sketchy thumb drive in, and he ran an executable, awesome. And it spins up, and there's these green things turning green and yellow and dots, and he's saying it works. And I was like, great. <laughs> and uh, then he starts installing an application. He goes, this is agent software. It's great for support. And uh, we kind of install it whenever we do new installs, and it's great. Um, it lets you do things with your router, like uh, reset your password or do some configuration. Whatever. OK, thanks. Get out of my house. So the guy heads out. And about 20 minutes later, after doing whatever, I come in and I realize I need to log in and set up my wireless name and do all the stuff you need to do when you get a new Wi-Fi at your house or a new, new uh, setup for the ISP. And I realized I didn't know what the password of the router was, and I was like, all right, I will just reset it real quick. But the app was still up on my computer. So I'm like, huh, oh, why, why not? So I clicked reset router password, and it prompted me, said, what do you want the new password to be? And I said it. And uh, I went to the web browser, and, and it worked. And I was kind of fascinated. I was like, how does that work? And I was like, it didn't ask me for the old password. I was like, interesting. But, I, but I, maybe I missed something the technician did. I don't know. So uh, I did it again, and it worked. And it didn't ask me for the password that I just said, because I thought maybe it's in some sort of factory mode, you know, and whatever. No, I just set the password, and it didn't ask me for the old one, but it let me set the password again. So I was like, well, maybe there's something unique to this computer. Maybe the tech had put in a tech ID. or So I went upstairs. I downloaded it from the ISP's website, this application. I installed it, and I reset my router's password again. And I was like, curious. <laughs> so that's what started this uh, digging into how this application works. So the first thing I did on my VM was I just started Wireshark. And it made no sense to me. I started watching as I booted up the, uh, this app and started clicking on things. I was looking at these Git requests with weird uh, parameters like mimic button, and uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't see authentication going. You know, I saw these cookies being passed, but I never saw them being set. Um, and I just, it, it made no sense to me. And, and then I'm seeing post requests, and I'm just like, what is going on? It, made, they, it looked like passwords were being submitted However, I never put in passwords, and just watching Wireshark and the interaction between this software and my router was really confusing to me. And I, I, I wanted to understand more about what was going on. And while I was in Wireshark, oh, let me pause for one moment before we get deep into it. I'm not, I've gone, I've taken some cursory steps to kind of obfuscate the name of the major ISP for two main reasons. One, is I don't want this talk to be, it's not about bashing an individual company. Because realistically, let's think about it, any company, if you put them under scrutiny or any application, you're probably going to find flaws. So I don't want this to be a specific company bashing fest. That's not the point. The point is about the process, the end result, and the flow of the research. Uh, and second, they asked me not to. So, and they were, since they were really nice about it and they were cool, they didn't ask me not to um, because they were ashamed. They really didn't want to be uh, the targets of uh, attack, and it's not target, but I just like saying the word target and I breached, yeah. Um, no, they didn't want to un invite undue uh, uh, scrutiny, and I, I, I wasn't actually going to do it anyways, because like I said earlier, I'd already decided it's not about a company, it's about the process, so that's that. But that being said, this is a room full of brilliant hackers, and it's not hard to figure it out. Um, and if you catch me in the restaurant or something later, I'm not going to not say it, it's just in the talk while I'm being recorded. Uh, <laughs> so, anyways, I started noticing something within the Wireshark capture. I, every time I started this application, uh, there was some traffic that was going to the internet. And, it, it, and I correlated it just by inferring that I'd stop it, it stopped. I started it, it started. I was like, okay, I want to see that. And then it was encrypted, but I noticed by just right-clicking on it following the stream and, and doing some who is on the IP, I was like, well, that has to do with the ISP, and it, in the certificate info, there was a brief, unencrypted bit of the actual name of the host that, uh, or whoever signed the certificate or whatever, that was, um, you can see it, I put a square block around it. There was a name there. And I was like, okay, this is the information that I want to see. So I took steps to see it. And this is kind of neat. If you've never done it before, um, I hadn't. So what I needed to do is I needed to proxify uh, an application that wasn't uh, meaning to be proxy. There were no proxy settings. So I downloaded this free trial of an app 
I think it's a pay-for app, but you get a 10-day trial of Proxy Fire. It's like proxy chains for Windows. You can buy the binary or just all the things you can send um, to a proxy. And so uh, I installed it and I said, everything on this VM, go through Burp, because I heart Burp. I installed this Burp CA on my VM so it wouldn't get bad cert issues. I also needed to configure the Burp SSL settings so that it presented a certificate that was named the name of the host that I was interested in intercepting the traffic. And the final very important step, which I had not done in the past, was configure invisible proxying. And if you have used Burp a lot and messed with the proxy settings, you'll notice there's a checkbox at the very bottom that says invisible proxy mode. And it says don't use if you don't need it or don't use if it's unnecessary or something like that. Anyways, it's off by default. And what I found out was if you Google invisible proxying, the first result is a Portswigger um, blog post that explains it really well. So this is an excerpt, or I've taken this info from Portswigger because they said it well. Basically, a proxy compliant request is submitted from a proxy aware application with the, um, the host portion, the protocol and host portion of the uh, request uh, in, uh, as part of the Git. And the proxy aware application doesn't look at the host header to get it. Non proxy aware requests in the Git request or any kind of HTTP request just send the path and the non-proxy uh, device says, the, your, it looks at the host header to decide where it's going. So if you don't set this setting and you're forcing an application that's not meant to be through a proxy, through a proxy, it's not gonna work properly. But this cool option in Burp, if you enable it, Burp then starts looking to the host header to figure out where to go. And without setting that, this process doesn't work. But I did, and all of a sudden, uh, the encrypted traffic between the application on my machine and this ISP web service, I could see all the requests. And this is where it started to get interesting. So I started, I, I, at first I didn't touch anything. I just started up the application, I just watched what it was doing, talking over the internet. And the first thing was this post request that had really only this kind of good, weird looking number in it. But remember that, it ends in DB02. And the end result of this request was my WAN IP address. It just kind of like splashed, it echoed onto my screen. So it's like it was saying, what's my IP? interesting. So the next request after this was a post. And you notice that, that value that says GUI session ID still ends in DB02, but it has my WAN IP address in the middle of it. But really key in on that GUI session ID because this ends up being important. But the only real things that were interesting in this request was a keyword value, and in this case it's talking about some configuration. It's sending this information to a SOAP service, and the keyword value and the GUI session ID are really the only thing that is sent. Now, I, oh, let me see. Uh, and there was no, uh, no interesting, to that request, there was nothing interesting in the, in the response. It was just, like, weirdness. So, another post I see, and again, I'm not doing anything at this point. I'm watching what the app is doing, just watching. So there's this post, and now we see a new keyword, and what, as I researched the service, I found out the keyword dictated what type of activity was supposed to happen, the, what data was returned or processed by this, this service on the internet. But I, I'm a little, I start getting a little annoyed. I see stuff that I don't understand why it's being sent. I see my personal MAC address being sent. We still have that same GUI session ID being sent. I see my Windows host name for my machine, and I see my Windows username. Um, and I'm like, wh why? I'm a little annoyed but I'm just still watching. Now the response was a little annoying, and I apologize if you can't really see, but I'll, I'll go over it. So there's this keyword response, and it's a cached LR, and remember the first keyword to this request was line record dash CV. This returned a cached line record. So just through inference and, and going through, I realized that line record CV was kind of like cached value, or had to do with caching. So this is cached data on me. But the response contained my zip code, uh, my state, my ISP login name, which happened to be first, not last, and my county, and I had home phone service with this uh, ISP, and I had my phone number in there. And you know, it's not any, of course the ISP has this information. They have to bill me for services. And I, I'm not surprised that they have this kind of demographic data, but why is this weird application querying the service and returning it to me? I'm, I'm just a little curious at this point. Still curious. So then, again, haven't touched anything, just watching what this app does. There's this post. The only thing in this post request is that um, GUI session ID. This is from a different uh, time I was testing, so the GUI session ID is different, but remember it. 
So the keyword has this Wi-Fi info in it, PCIHA Wi-Fi info. And it re returns the name of my wireless network and my wireless password and my security type. And I was like, what? <laughs> And keep in mind, this is not talking to my router on my LAN. This is over the interwebs. And it says, yes, we have your wireless network name and your wireless password. Have at it. I'm not quite getting it. And now I'm in full on a little tweaked mode. And I'm like, well, now we're going to look at this hard. So I started uh, tinkering. Oh, and this is the last couple of requests before I actually started doing anything with the app. Again, this is just me looking. I notice this login keyword is sent, and they get to have more data. Um, they have my, my operating system version is sent. Then, if they didn't have it before, they have my wireless network name, my security type, and my password for my wireless network. They have the amount of RAM on my machine, my disks, network, and fixed. Um, a whole bunch of stuff just posted from my machine, posted over the internet to this ISP. And now I go in and I say, okay, let me go in and just click the button that I'm really interested in, change the password. So I click the button to change the password, I put in a new one, and I hit submit. And yes, it sends the router password, it posted it, to the internet, to this ISP thing. And then I saw all this voodoo happen between the application, voodoo in Wireshark just saw traffic. And again, I couldn't make no sense of it, and we'll get to that in a bit. But I just, so now I'm like, uh, what? So this is what I like to call my selfish phase. I was really, really curious, but selfishly. I'm like, why do they have all this data? To what end do they need my wireless network name, my wireless password, my router password, and all this other stuff? I'm just, I don't get it. And so I'm thinking it through. But then as I'm thinking, I also start getting beyond being curious and being selfish, and I get curious about the information disclosure. And I was remembering, I'm looking, and I didn't see much having to do with authentication here. I was like, well, obviously, there's got to be secret sauce. But um, during the research, I, I saw a couple cookies set at one point. But you noticed in those requests, there was no cookies. There was a couple cookies that came across the wire. Um, I removed them. I messed with them. I set them to blah. Didn't affect the outcome. So cookies wasn't it. So I was like, there's got to be something. This application has to authenticate to this soap service of a major ISP before I can just get all the things. It has to be related to maybe my circuit ID, because while I was going, I saw things related to, um, like, it seemed like networking terminology, circuits and IDs and all this stuff. I was like, there's something there. And I was like, I wonder if I could see other people's stuff with this. But I was like, that is a gray area, and I was like, that's bordering on a black area. I am a suburban dad with two kids. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the dude before me mentioned you know, Arnheimer and, and the whole Weave case and whatnot. I mean, cats, and, cats looking at jail time and stuff for getting, you know, for getting email addresses. I was like, I'm not, I don't know if I want to mess with this. And, and, but I did want more info. So what I did was I decided to play with every aspect that I could through the GUI uh, of this application and really just started clicking everything. Every option, every menu, uh, every setting, every checkbox, everything that had a submit button, I clicked on it and I watched. I watched locally on the machine with Process Hacker and the different sys internal tools, watching the registries, the files accessed and written to, uh, and watching the state of my virtual machine, because I, you know, I was noting those down because I wanted to go take a look at those, uh, the binaries and, and different things that were logged. And then I continued to watch all the traffic through Burp as well and started to build a profile of what this application did and correspond activity within the interface to the different post requests to the SOAP service. And I learned that that keyword value is really, um, every time you did something, it would change the keyword and you would get different results from the service. Um, so, while I was doing this, uh, I was, went to the directory that was being um, called a whole bunch, and uh, with happenstance, I ended up opening the directory and discovered that it was written in AutoIt, because I had AutoIt installed on the VM, and they hadn't changed the default icon for the compiled binary. So I didn't have to do anything other than look, I was like, oh, that's AutoIt. If you've never seen AutoIt, uh, I think it's version 3, it's kind of like a wrapper, a basic like syntax wrapper language, it's really, I, I like to play with it. You can do some funny things, uh, you can do some useful things, but you could simulate, um, one way that it's used and it's really easy is to simulate like synthetic user transactions and to uh, simulate mouse clicks or simulate uh, working with uh, the um, graphical interface on Windows. You can also do things behind the scenes, but 
Um, I was like, this is you know, a pretty big app. I, would, I was kind of expecting it to be a .NET app or something like that, but it was written in Autoit. And the one thing with Autoit, unless you take very deliberate steps, um, it's trivial to, I'll even put quotes on there, reverse engineer it. And it's not reverse engineering, really. I downloaded an app made to do this called My EXE to AUT, and you just point and click, and if they haven't taken steps to uh, protect this compiled binary, it, it dumps the code uh, for the binary back into the original Autoit script, and you can just read it. So that's what I did. And as I started going through, what I found out was, is this app was a wrapper around interacting with my router, <laughs> among other things, and obviously interacting with the ISP service over the internet. But it was like, the reason why I couldn't see stuff in Wireshark and why I was just seeing gits and posts and never put in any data or saw any hard-coded data is because it was actually pretending to be an invisible person typing in the password hitting submit, hitting buttons behind the scenes using Autoit to simulate. So it was all this JavaScript stuff expecting input. Autoit was giving it input. And I also found this gen GUID in all the binaries that I came across. And uh, I, I had to kind of give it extra lines. But basically, what that string of Autoit code is, is it gives a format that the GUID has to conform to. And then it, if you look, it just fills it with random, 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 random data. In essence, what that means is the GUID session ID just has to be a specific format. It doesn't matter what data it is, as long as the format conforms to what's expected for it. So, I had an accident. It's a genuine accident, I promise. <laughs> I, uh, but throughout this accident, I confirmed and tested that the GUID session ID was indeed random. I confirmed that if you could call it authentication, it was what was used as authentication. And I totally accidentally pulled some other dude's stuff. And here's why I'm telling you it's an accident and why you can look at me in the eyes and be like, he's an honest guy. I, went, I, took, a, I took a break. I, I, like I said, I'm a suburban dad. I took a week off for Christmas. I saved my research states and I went and I hung out with my family for a couple weeks. Or I took a week off and I didn't come back to the research for a few weeks. And when I did, um, I pulled up my saved burp states to start the research again. Now, problem is, unbeknownst to me, my IP address had changed. Either we had lost power or ZHCP voodoo happened and my WAN IP was now different. However, comma, all my saved research states had my IP address that I had when I was doing the original research. So uh, the first thing I do is I fire up this request and um, the only thing that it sent is this random GUI session ID that I generated and look at it, it ends in 98 CD, the keyword value and the WAN IP. Now notice the response is new content. So I removed the CV1 from line record and I realized that that was now a new query. It didn't pull cache content. And I apologize for the, the smallness of this uh, bubble out I'm calling out. But I pulled some other dude's stuff. Same state, different zip code, different username, different city. Uh, his phone number was in there too, different phone number. And uh, I was panicked. I was like, I just pulled some other dude's stuff. Totally by accident. But I'm, you know, visions of weave and people being arrested and guys going to jail for like, you have a cross-site scripting on your site. I'm like, you're going to jail. I was like, oh my gosh. But I also was like, you know what, in for a penny, in for a dime. Uh... <laughs> so I had another request queued up. And notice this one is an interesting keyword. It was, uh, this, it's one I noticed while I was doing research and I'd saved it called PC Router Sid Webkey. Only thing I'm posting here, the only thing is that same GUI session ID and that keyword, and it pulls back what looks like a wireless network name and a web key and the encryption type for another dude. But see, I, I didn't know who this dude was. I could call him since I have his phone number. <laughs> but uh, I didn't know how to verify that. Like, maybe this is not his real data. I'm hoping it's not because I'm kind of scared. So I call a buddy of mine, I'm like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, do you mind I'm doing something? He knows I'm a tinker, tinkerologist, and he was like, uh, I was like, look, I'm doing a little bit of research, do you mind if I use you for testing? He's like, that's fine. So I was like, go to this website, what's my IP? Give me your WAN IP address. Um, and he goes, okay. So that's all he gave me was his internet IP address, WAN IP address. And I was like, is this your network name? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, well, go look at your computer. Tell me what wireless network you're connected to right now. And he goes, yeah, that's my network name. How'd you do that? And I was like, is this your network, you know, the password that you type in to get on your network? And he's like, I don't know. It's written on the fridge. Hold on. <laughs> so he goes and he's like, 
yeah, that's, that's totally what I type in to connect to my wireless network. And I was like, cool, cool, and I hung out. <laughs> so, so I was a little miffed, and I started testing, and one thing that I found while I was testing this, and I didn't test a lot because I was a little worried, but I, I started, I was like, you know what, I'm a customer, and I'm not doing anything outside of what's presented via this service, but it's still dicey. I was like, oh, this is dangerous. I'm not sure what to do. I was a little nervous. But I did do some testing, and what I found was tons of people have WEP. Uh, tons of people, most people have WEP. And it's, I guess it's because back in the day when ISP folks would set it up, uh, the default was WEP. I don't know. Whatever. A lot of WEP out there. But here's my thought. So I did. I sat on it for a while. I was like, uh, am I going to get in trouble? What if the ISP doesn't even care? They may be like, we're big. Screw you. So I sat on it for a bit while I talked it over with myself. It was a short conversation. With peers, colleagues, got some input. So I finally decided I was going to approach them. So this was the disclosure process for me. At first, it was tough to find a point of contact to talk to. I, I didn't have any channels. I tried emailing abuse at isp.com. I tried calling, like, you know, the people you call when your internet's down. I called support. That's the only thing that was, I was like, I, funny story, I have something I need to tell you about. And as I even tried to talk to these technicians and these managers, uh, like support folks, they weren't getting it. Some were just blowing me off. They're like, oh, that's a feature. Uh, we need it. <laughs> <laughs> we need that information for troubleshooting. <sighs> no, you don't. And uh, then I, I, got, I, stopped, I did three or four calls that got nowhere, and I was like, uh, this is not smart. I need a record of what I'm doing. So I started doing the chat with support, like save my chat histories. And uh, it was a, a, a bit before I found someone to talk to. And actually on IRC, a friend of mine was like, hey, I know somebody really sharp at that ISP. Here's their name. And uh, so I emailed this cat. And he responded in seven minutes and was like, hello. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. This is kind of a big deal. Can you get on a conference call tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh my gosh. So before the conference call, what I focused on was um, I was not going to be what the media says hackers are. I was going to be focused on tact and professionalism. I was also going to speak like I had every right to be doing what I did because I'm a customer and I'm concerned because that's my data that can, be got, that can be slurped from anyone. And if I found this, who's to say somebody else hasn't and already has all the things? Because I'm not that sharp. If I figured it out, I'm sure plenty of other folks did. <clears throat> So when I came on, I was an advocate for just fixing the problem. I was not accusing them, and I was focusing on tact and professionalism. And in this situation, it worked out really well. The ISP was like, wow, you know, this is, you know, thanks for bringing this to our attention. They fixed it within a couple days, and they, they fixed it, and then they asked me to check it. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'll get into how it was fixed in a minute, but... So they, they did, and, and they actually were very, throughout the whole process, they were like, thank you so much. We, you know, we appreciate this, your professionalism, all that stuff. And they gave me a discount on my service, and that's sweet. And it's still on there. Like, it's still, it's still discounted. So I wanted to summarize some of the things. Oh, I, I probably burned through. This might be a short one. <laughs> probably burned, burned through my time. A uh, caveat is this is based on my research and what I saw. So it's not empirical and not verified, but what I did notice was the folks affected by this flaw seemed to have to conform to the following traits. They were using the ISP provided gear, you know, that router that you get from the ISP, and they had run that application. Um, if they hadn't, which I did have an opportunity to test on some folks, um, I tested it on someone who had the ISP gear but had never run the agent application, and I didn't pull any in cool data uh, they did, I did get their phone number, but I didn't get anything else. And uh, I did it to someone who had I, this ISP service and had their own gear and had never run the application. And in, similarly, no data. So it appeared it had to be home users or business users that had the ISP gear and ran the, uh, the app. And so the fix, when I say it was fixed, from my perspective, I, tr I just did what I did by accident. I replayed those requests, and this time I got errors. So they added in something that did not let me see anything but my data, because that, those requests still worked dealing with myself. Uh, and I, now, that the, I, now that they're aware of all the things, I wasn't going <laughs> to dig any further, because I was like, that's, that's my disclosure for the year. 
but um, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. They didn't send me to jail, which is cool. However, comma, the data is still being sent. Like you download the agent and still run and it still does all these things. It's just you as an individual can't, I can't, I won't say you can't, but using my method, you are not able to trivially retrieve other folks' stuff. Um, we all know this, but one of the points is that implicit trust in anything, services, software, applications, anything really, is obviously not a good thing. And it's really up to us as a community, in my opinion, to raise awareness of this kind of thing. Um, and not only, I mean, we all have jobs. We're defending the networks, we're attacking the networks, we're working on the databases and systems, we're coding up apps. We have jobs for the companies uh, we work for, and it's true, but as a community, we can also shed light on instances like this, where maybe there's a facet of technology that's not getting scrutiny like it should, or just go home to your own environment. What's running on your phone? What's running on your own network at home? Take a look at it, watch it. You might be surprised uh, with what you see, and in this case, I feel like helped maybe protect data of other people and mainly protect my data from getting from other people. But um, Everything that I did could be done free and it was on my own network with free tools and just watching the wire and doing a little fiddling. I did want to warn you. I'm not saying this is a de facto how disclosure is going to go, obviously. In this situation, it was good, but you really have to take it case by case. I'm, the, the guy before us explained the cybercrime laws. In my opinion, cybercrime laws are so open to prosecutorial discretion. Um, it's really how you approach the person you're disclosing to or the entity you're disclosing to based on their, it will base, will, will dictate their response. So if you come at them hard, like, oh, I can't believe this is awful, you should feel stupid, they're going to respond in kind or defensive. Um, if you come at them as an advocate or a liaison, and in my, in my case, like I said, I felt like I had a bit of a right since I was a customer. I wasn't just some random guy like, I found the things. I was like, I'm a customer and I found your things. Um, use discretion and common sense. Get guidance from trusted peers and the community. Uh, and when in doubt, you can always disclose anonymously. Now, you know, this isn't talking, this isn't a, a full disclosure debate. There's, I think there's merit in every type of disclosure. You know, the name and shame campaigns when uh, there's not traction on the incident. Going to the company directly and privately first is always, in my opinion, a good way to go. Um, but this is, these are all my opinions. I'm not a lawyer. So that's actually it for me. Um, I'll take any questions, but Got you early, and all right, I think I saw you first. All right, um, can you look into what the mechanism was between the agent and the routers and the Yeah, so his question was, what was the mechanism between the application, the, the agent software, and the actual home router? So it was that auto it binary was actually taking data that had um, been provided. Like, in its case, it had a list of default username and passwords uh, to try the first time, and then when you put in the new password and you changed it, it saved it somewhere, like a log file, it wrote it down. That's a good point, too. I found a clear text log file of all of these things, too, on the, saved in the agent directory. I'll, I'll get there one second. So anyways, it was basically this agent software was s simulating me typing that stuff in to the router. That's why I couldn't tell anything from the Git request. Uh, I'll get to you in one second. I actually saw one over here, I think. Yeah, that's my question. Oh, cool. Great. So is it clear? Yeah, I, does that make sense? Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm glad you clarified that. He was saying it wasn't being done remotely. Like the internet service uh, provider's internet IP was not connecting to my router and doing things. It was, this connection was going to the internet, but when anything needed to happen on my router, this auto it binary was pretending to be a user and submitting requests and simulating button clicks and simulating typing things in, simulating clicking a radio button. It was, so it's kind of like a hack job binary. Um, sorry I didn't make that clear, but yeah, that was it. So you had a question, yes, sir? Ah, good, good question, good question. He was asking, if you didn't hear, did I test making changes on my router without using the agent software? Um, would this eventually sync up? And the answer is yes. So what I found is every time you booted up this agent-based app, it kind of like dumped all the things that would be interesting and posted them to the ISP. So the ISP was always up to date. And when I was talking to the support folks about this, they were like, oh yeah, it's for support. You know, our biggest call is, I don't know my router password. And so we can just have them reset it. 
I was like, well, you actually could just show it to them. <laughs> I did say that. They, they were like, what? And then um, they're like, this is for troubleshooting, you know? And I was like, well, why do you need my disk space? They're like, well, if the disk's full, maybe it's causing errors. I was like, if the disk's full, I'm not going to call Verizon. Oh, no. Oh. I tr not cool. Forget that. We edit that. That was a big mistake. I tried so hard. I practiced in front of my wife so long to just keep saying ISP. I apologize. This was not intentional. I really apologize. Edit that out. Forget it. Where's the men in black thing? Ah, oh, dang. What's up? I don't have that phone number anymore, but yeah, I was. That was my real phone. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, I know that when I tried to do what I did, I was getting 500 internal server errors. You and then you. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. See, there's so many things that I meant to say. So I even went to another ISP's network. <laughs> See, I was, it's because I was off script. I was so good. At, I went off script and I lost it. So yes, I tested it from uh, other networks and it still worked. So it had nothing to do with Good point, on like the circuit ID or being on that network giving me access, I could do this. I tested on two different ISPs networks um, and could still pull it. So it was all based on this SOAP service on some random ISPs network. Uh, Mr. Glass. Oh, dang. What's up? Ah, uh, I don't know. So his question is now, on this ISP's website, you can register, uh, I think, on the web even now, um, over the internet, and set things up. I don't know because I, they've completely uh, changed this whole binary. I, I, I don't think it's AutoIt anymore. I think it's .NET. I, I haven't looked. I need to reinvigorate this research and look at this new version. I think they've kind of retooled how they do things. I, I don't know. Um, yes, sir. It doesn't. It just throws every request. When I did try that recently too, every request just throws these either um, server errors or uh, it just says um, it just three hundred twos me to a random splash. So it doesn't seem like the the old foo works. Yes. I didn't, I didn't see that. His question was, was it just my local PC sending info to the ISP or was it uh, other stuff connected to the net network? You know, it seemed like this agent was the catalyst for all this data. And since the agent was running on a local PC, which was a VM, it was only information about that VM uh, that I saw. I didn't see, like, my phone's or my wife's computer's information being sent. Yes? Did it have any other information about other devices that you had part of your service on I didn't, uh, oh, so it did have services, like what I paid for, like if I had, uh, so the response said if I had phone, internet, or TV, gave my up and down speeds, is that what you're talking about? Well, like you get a Merle box with certain service providers, and it connects to it over like a, a Doxis. Gotcha. No, his question was, was it any other um, information about ISP-related services being sent back and forth? I didn't see it at the time. Uh, I think it was you. Say it one more time. Ah, ha. So while I was on the call with this ISP, uh, I did say that it seems, it was, it, it seemed more, that the dudes who were on the call were like, there was people who developed the application, there was like, a, I think a lawyer or two, and there was uh, security people. And the security people were kind of not happy. They were like, I can't believe this is a thing. This is not, this is not good. <laughs> the developers were really quiet, super quiet. <laughs> And, um, no, the security guys were like, you could even hear them. They, they maybe thought they were on mute, but like, they're like, why does they do that? We don't need that. Um, they never explained it, no. Uh, good, good question, good question. Um, you know, I didn't try that. I was, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, the question was, is I could see other people's stuff, could I change other people's stuff? Um, 
I don't know. I don't know if I could reset their wireless network name and their wireless password to something I knew or something if I wanted to be lame. Um, I don't know. We'll never know. Did they offer your job? They did. Uh uh. He asked if I set up a public side tap on my WAN interface to watch the traffic going back and forth. I didn't do that. If you want to donate a tap, I will. Anybody else? Oh, I'm. Uh, do you know, I'm just wondering about the application was pulling the data like the SSID and the WPA passwords from the router itself? No, no. It was pulling it from the SOAP service. Well, how did that get up to the SOAP service? Oh, okay. His question is, is how did the information get populated very first? So, at the first, how am I on time? Okay, we're, we've got plenty of time. We've got 10 minutes. My goodness. We can just wrap all night. Um, the very first time it did anything, um, it attempted to log into the router uh, with a list of known default passwords. So, it, the reason why the very first time it changed the password was the tech had set it to, a, it, or from the factory, it has a default password in it. So, it, it logs in, um, and I assume it passes that default value that's there forward. Um, but then when, then when I went to change anything, it stored what I was changing and every time the app launches, whether you change anything or not, it sends that data that's stored to the, to the ISP. So in the, that's why it's really, this flaw was only, it was necessary for them to have run the app at least once. Because it, I don't, th I don't know. I can't definitively say empirically. I can't say empirically. Now, from my testing, they changed what, like they've completely redesigned the entire system, and it doesn't work the way I was testing it anymore. Um, but no, I, well, since I didn't test messing with other people's data, I can't definitively say that. But I, you had to run, to have data stored on you, you had to have run this application. As far as messing with this stuff, um, I don't think you could send data over the internet, like, it seemed to be a one way. Like, the data that was created by the um, binary was local, and it was telling the internet IP address about things, but it was always doing things from the app to my local router, simulating user action. It didn't seem, it never queried data from the internet and use that to change. Because I did do that. Like in some of the responses, I even modified data to see if I could muck with my own stuff. If I hadn't done it through the app, it wouldn't happen. It didn't read data from the internet and decide what to do. It was reading stuff from like text files and local, if I did it locally. Any questions? Yes, sir. No, so um, this, this ISP got the ire of my focus because they're who I use. Um, if I had somebody else, I would be looking at them. So it's up to you. If you have different ISPs, all of them, test out their stuff. See how it works. I haven't had the opportunity to look at other agent-based software and other ISPs yet. So we have a couple minutes. If not, I can end it. But if we have uh, no more questions... I think we're good. All right, that's it.